Well, good morning. My name is David Kenny, and I am the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas, and you are watching our services online on YouTube, and we are in our fourth week of a series entitled Called to be Saints, and we got the title from Romans chapter 1, verse 7. Paul is talking to the Romans, and he says, all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, and I believe that This is what we've been coming to understand lately through the different lessons that we've been just preaching even since summer began is that, you know, we we are called to be saints, not as disciples and and not just as Christians, but, but as people who are holy and who are set apart, people who have a purpose. And so as we always talk about uh, what Christians believe, we're talking about what Christians do. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's us, right? We are saints. And we're looking at the book of Acts, looking at the early church and seeing how the early church uh, acted, things they did, how they started, and hopefully drawing some lessons from what we see them doing, seeing if there's some things there we can adopt. A few weeks ago when we started, we talked, of course, about integrity, being people of integrity, being honest people, uh, not having a facade, but being uh, authentic. Uh, The second week we talked about generosity, not just with our, our treasure, but also our time and our talents. And then we talked about prayer last week and our spiritual growth. And this week I wanna look at service. So we're going back to the early church again. We're going to be in Acts chapter 9, and we're going to see if there might be something there that might put us on the right path. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 says, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any belonging to the way, this would be the the Christians, right, the group of Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. You know, before he was the Apostle Paul, he was Saul. He was a bounty hunter. He was a bounty hunter for the Pharisees who would travel from town to town, and he arrested Christians. And verse 9 begins with this little piece of backstory for us. And then as we get to verses 10 and 11, I think we'll start to have some questions. Verse 10 says, Now there was a disciple meaning there's a Christian there, at Damascus named Ananias. Now, this is not the same Ananias uh, who sold property uh, with his wife, Sapphira, that we talked about a few weeks ago. This is different, different Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying. Now, in Acts chapter 9, the resurrected Jesus tells Ananias in prayer to do something I think that would have surprised him. This request would have filled him with dread. It's a very confusing ask. Jesus asks one of the new converts of the early church, a Christian, to go out and purposefully seek and find an enemy. A man who is, as the Bible says, breathing threats and murder against God's people. And God tells him exactly where to go, and he tells Ananias that, he is, that Paul is praying. Why? Why is Paul praying at this moment? Well, we have to go back. Verse 3 says, Now as Saul went on his way, he's going to Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you'll be told what you are to do. And the men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. So right now, Saul is still waiting. He is blinded, he is fasting, he is deep in prayer. Basically, God... It's the equivalent of God sent him to his room and said, I want you to think about what you've done, right? So Saul's in timeout. 
And then the narrative of the story shifts across town to another man, a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. Ananias was more than likely one of the spiritual leaders uh, of the Damascus church. And, you know, if that's the case, Saul could have maybe been in town specifically for Ananias. Verse 13, Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. So what do we notice? Saul has a reputation and Ananias knows about it. It's not like Ananias is walking into this blindly. Ananias says, Saul, uh, uh, Saul, Saul, the same guy who kills Christians, that Saul. And God says, go, for he is the chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. And so the first thing I want us to see is service is faith in action. Service is faith in action. You know, we've been using this series, Called to be Saints, to talk about what Christians do, our character, how we present ourselves. And we've kind of saved the biggest one for last. Saints, Christians, disciples, we serve. And right now, it, it looks like Jesus has just called Ananias to do the impossible. Teach junior high Sunday school. No, nothing that, nothing that hard. No, he's asking him to go find a man who is trying to kill him and lay hands on him and cure him of blindness. Sure, no big deal. So in order for Ananias to do this task, he's going to have to probably pray for God's presence, right? He's going to pray, Lord, be with me. Be with me as I go. No, God's with him. All I know, he's going to pray, Lord, keep me safe. Nope. There's no guarantees in life. Well, well, maybe if we pray for traveling mercies as we walk along the road. I don't even know what that means. Can someone find me the traveling mercies passage in the Bible? No, what Ananias is going to do is he's going to obey. He's going to obey his calling. And the strength that he has for this is going to be fueled by his faith. And it's going to come out in an act of service. And listen, you know, some people always ask, they say, well, how do I know if God is asking me to do something? How do I know what my calling is? Well, I would argue, if it seems impossible, <laughs> if it seems dangerous, if it seems too big, let me tell you something. You can probably bet that that's it. Ananias tries to get out of it. He says, Lord, I've heard about this guy. I don't know, maybe his reputation hasn't exactly reached up to heaven, but we all know him down here, and, and, and he's not a good guy. Do you realize what you are asking me to do? And God says, go. <laughs> right? That's the first word in verse 15, it, which is like, you know, the, it's the parent-child equivalent of, hey, I want you to do this. Why? Because I said so. Right? And then God says in verse 15, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. In other words, Jesus has work. He has service for Saul as well. Did, 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 did Saul get to decide his calling? Nope. God says, he is my chosen, my chosen instrument. And when Paul later writes of his own experience, he says to the Galatian church, I am Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. Paul says, human men, right, didn't send me. I am not under any human employment. My, my mission comes, and what does he say? He says it comes through Christ. In 2 Timothy 1, he says, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. You know, the 12 disciples, right? The 12 disciples, they were all called by Jesus personally from their different roles in life. And it was because they, they walked with Jesus. They were personally taught by him, baptized by him. They were witnesses to his death and resurrection. They all gained legitimacy after Christ's ascension. But Paul 
He doesn't have any of that. No, Paul says, I was appointed. <laughs> In other words, he says, I was handpicked. He was, he was personally called by Jesus the same way it would be for you or I. And when it's our turn and God calls us to service, it, it won't be for our gain. It won't be for our glory. It'll be to show that God reigns in our life and that we would do whatever he asks. Verse 17 says, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. And then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. Look, both, both of these stories, both of these, these characters, both Ananias and Saul, they, they illustrate the same truth. And that is the newly transformed life, the life lived in service to Christ, comes out by obedience, right? As Saul later writes to the Corinthians in chapter 4, this is how one should regard us. In other words, this is how we should be. This is what others should see when they look at us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Okay, so God says to Ananias that Saul is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. And verse 11 says that he's from Tarsus. And we know from other studies that Paul is a religious leader. He was part of a separatist group known as the Pharisees. And so when we wonder why God calls us to certain tasks or that he gifts us in very specific ways for ministry, it's because we end up being the perfect person for the job. Just like Paul is perfect for the job of being God's instrument to carry his name to the Gentiles. Why? Well, first because he's thoroughly versed in Jewish theology, language, culture. He's a native of Tarsus, but also equally at home within Greek culture. Paul is a citizen of the Roman Empire, plus he has a little side business where he makes tents, so uh, he's able to support himself financially. And I think this is a great example of the truth that God has a tailor-made ministry for each of us. I mean, yes, we're different, and, and, but, I, but I believe no one else is better suited to do what we can do or, or what Paul could do. And, and there's nobody else. There's nobody else in your circle of friends, your family that has your abilities and your passions and who's lived through your situations. That means God wants to send you. He wants to commission you to do something significant for the kingdom. God has a filling plan that will bring him glory through you, something that will advance his church. Secondly, I believe that service is spirit-filled. Service is spirit-filled. Verse 17 says, So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And you know, we might look at this miracle. Paul receives his sight, right? But, but this really becomes like a second Pentecost. Paul gets his own little Pentecost right here because it's in this moment that the Holy Spirit is uniquely strengthening him and filling him for service. How does that happen? How does the Holy Spirit fill us for service? I think two different ways. I mean, one, the Spirit takes our natural strengths and our natural abilities and uses them. I mean, look at Paul. Paul was a gifted and natural leader. He was a man of strong conviction. He was a self-starter. He was bold. He was a master of using both his time and his talents. 
He, he was self-motivated. He was a profound thinker, a good speaker. And second, I believe that the Holy Spirit also comes in and eliminates all the like undesirable characteristics. And then he replaces them with desirable ones. Think about Paul's shift from being Saul to Paul. He replaces Saul's cruel hatred with Paul's love. He replaces the restless, aggressive spirit of Saul with peace. He replaces the rough, hard-nosed treatment of people with gentleness. He replaces pride. You know, Paul talks about you know, reasons to boast. He replaces his pride with humility. And Paul ends up saying, out of all the sinners, I am the greatest. It's only the Spirit of God can cause that kind of transformation. Paul later writes about this to the Corinthian church. He says, but we all with unveiled faces beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as from the Lord the Spirit. You know, there's an old story about a convict of 20 years who shares his conversion story with his priest. And when the priest asked him, asked the convict, you know, what part did you play in your own salvation? The, he, he responded that, well, it was partly, partly God's work and partly my own. And the preacher was a little taken back by that answer, and he asked the convict to explain himself, to which the man said, well, I opposed God all I could, and he did the rest. And I think this is why God changed Saul's name. His old life, his old experience, his old resistance was changed. Saul of Tarsus was a former rabbi. He was a former persecutor. He was a former agent of the high priest. But now he is transformed by God. Now he's filled with the Holy Spirit. Now he's God's instrument, chosen to carry God's name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Third, third, service leads to fellowship with other saints. Why do we do this? It leads to fellowship. Verse 18 says, Immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized. In taking food, he was strengthened. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. Now, the Greek words here for fell and scales, they only occur just this one time here in the New Testament. Scales is the Greek word lepis. It's a medical term for a first century growth of skin that would cause blindness. And all of this, his name change, his blindness, it can be seen as this symbolic act of Saul's conversion from old to new, from dark to to light. So notice right away, Paul is baptized. And in so doing, he joins the church in fellowship. That one act, public act, he joins in with every other person. People who he hated, people who he persecuted, his enemies, listen to this, his enemies became his family. Verse 19 says, he also took food and was strengthened, and that he remained for some days with the disciples who were at Damascus, allowing them to celebrate his conversion with him and minister to his needs. Can you imagine the overwhelming joy of these days where they rejoice in Paul's conversion and that there's just all kinds of worship and singing? You know, I, I know that we often struggle with going to a new church or even being at a church for a long time and thinking like, nobody knows me here. Or, I don't know anybody here. Or, I don't feel like I could break into this church or this church feels cliquish. I just don't feel like I'm a part of this congregation. Certainly, you can join a church, right? That's a good first step is to join a church. But even then, uh, you can still not have that same feeling of belonging and that feeling of closeness. The Bible calls us 
to fellowship with one another. Proverbs 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron, and one man sharpens another. Hebrews 10 says, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Galatians 6 says, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I think oftentimes you'll hear advice, you know, people will say, oh, you want to make friends? You want to meet people? You should join a church. But just attending a church, it can sometimes feel just as lonely as before. But I believe you and I, we are responsible. We are responsible for the time we have and who we decide to allow into our life. So I would say stay for potlucks. Don't run off. Stay for potlucks. Join the adult Sunday school class at 11 o'clock. Be a greeter. We need greeters right now. Do me a favor and, and send an email to office at waldenchurch.com uh, and, and, and you don't even need to be a member. Give us your name and number, give us your working email and just say, hey, I wanna be a greeter, okay? And, and tell us if you wanna be a greeter in the 9.30 service or the 11 o'clock service. I promise you, the more of you that volunteer to be a greeter, the less you will actually have to work. <laughs> but that's a great way to meet people. Help us teach Sunday school, please. I need some people to commit, I really do. If, and if you see uh, Bob Deering or Flip Holstein or Gordon Silkwood, can you please thank them and fist bump them? They have been at this church for weeks getting all of our Sunday school classrooms ready to receive kids again. But we can't do it without teachers. Why? Because service is where we proclaim the gospel. That's number four. Service is where we proclaim the gospel. The Bible says after Paul got fed and after he spent time with the disciples, he immediately proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying he is the son of God. You know, those of us who've been touched by the hand of Jesus, those of us who've been forgiven, who've been given a new life, our first impulse should be to tell someone about it. I notice when Luke writes this book, he uses the word immediately. Immediately he proclaimed. He didn't wait to witness. And although we don't necessarily rush into ministry unprepared, we also don't, don't need to wait. We don't need to wait before telling others about our encounter with Christ. And if you're sitting here this morning or you're watching online and you believe, I'm ready, right? You're thinking, I'm ready to start plugging in and serving we need you. I want you to think today about something that you could do that fits your gifts and your interests. And let me just list a few. You know, I said we needed help with kids, and that includes childcare, nursery, teaching, assisting with Sunday school. We also need help with special children's events like the Easter egg hunt, VBS, trunk or treat. We also need people who have computer and technical skills. We need people who are running our tech sound booth for both of our morning services, uh, we need people that might have some computer skills or any interest working with video or sound, uh, people who could help us advance the slides. It'd be great if we had someone who would volunteer to come during choir practice and just run the sound system and advance the slides for them so that would go smoothly. We would love to have somebody help maintain our web page or our social media pages. We need people that can troubleshoot problems with our office equipment or troubleshoot uh, problems with our office netware, network or uh, be in charge of our phones. That would be great. Uh, we need people that have skills in music and choir and drama. It could be something as simple as joining the choir, but if you have talents in other artistic or performing ways, I am certain that we could give you an opportunity. You should never forget the important role played by people who have gifts in other areas too, like hospitality. You know, we have a hospitality group and we have a fellowship group. In addition to the fellowship time that we have through uh, coffee and donuts when we have it, uh, we have special meals on a regular basis too. And if you've got skills there, I guarantee you there is opportunities for you. Maybe you'd be interested in encouraging people. Could you send notes 
on behalf of the church, cards to shut-ins, or could you pray for people on our prayer list, or, or send greetings or condolences or birthdays, or maybe you phone some of the older people on a regular basis just to check up on them and send them a, a nice word. You know, I mentioned greeters before. Maybe you could greet people as they arrive to service or just make sure that people feel welcome. And that's just scratching the surface. You know, we need folks who can help keep the property and the lawn and the maintenance uh, around the outside of the building cared for. We need people who will help keep in contact with the missionaries that we have. Maybe you have a talent that I haven't even mentioned, you know, and you see a need. There's a good possibility that God is nudging you in that direction. How will you respond today? Would you please respond with service? I want to close to you by reading Paul's words about serving and what it accomplishes through the church. And I would just say, if any of those things sounded interesting to you or remotely like, yeah, I could plug into that, can you please send the church office an email at office at waldenchurch.com and say specifically, you know, Pastor David said this and I want to do this. That would really help us. Ephesians 4.14 says, Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head that is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. That's the work each one doing their part, that we are called as saints to do. We are authentic and honest people. We are generous with our time and our wealth. We are dedicated to our spiritual growth through prayer, and we serve this kingdom and the God that we love. Even Jesus Christ, by his own example, showed us that he got up from the table, wrapped a towel around him, and washed his neighbor's feet. Our attitudes about service should flow out from our heart and it spills out into our actions. We are called to be saints. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you for this growth opportunity where we are reminded that it isn't about sitting, it's about doing. And not that we are saved by works, but we work and we serve because of our love for you. Your Holy Spirit prompts us to want to serve our neighbor, to love our neighbor. Lord, if there is anything in me that you have gifted me in any way, if there is any way that I can serve your church or serve your kingdom, I would ask that you would just begin to reveal that in me. Reveal to me my gifts and my talents. Show me the area and the direction that I might best serve your church. I want to build your kingdom. I want to grow closer to the people on my left and right. I want to build a family here at this church. I want to know you more deeply, and I want to feel the love of your Son, be strengthened by the Holy Spirit as I advance the kingdom for the Father. I am so excited. Lord, I want to partner with you every day. I want to work alongside you every day. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for allowing me to be part of your kingdom. Amen. Hey, I want to thank you for uh, watching this service online. And just a reminder that it is a YouTube video. And of course, that means that there's a URL. And you can share that uh, with your friends and neighbors on their social media pages, uh, especially if you think this might benefit them. Or just post it to your own wall and just let everyone else know uh, about your connection with Walden Community Church. Thanks so much for watching. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye.